Hi there, Dr. Tanzavati here. This video today is going to be about uh, your consent for rhinoplasty surgery. It is a very long consent. You should have received a document that has all of the information for the consent process, and it is about 13, 14 pages, I believe. So I'm gonna highlight the most important um, parts of the consent, and then when you come in for your surgery, we will go over, over that again and have you sign that with me. So let me start by saying that rhinoplasty surgery is very uh, person uh, specific for each patient. So that means each patient is going to have a different surgery than the next. It's not, um, it's not like a, I don't have a cookie cutter approach to this surgery. So know that that means that every case is different. And what I recommend for you or what we've morphed on the photos as to what your nose is going to look like is not going to be the same for each person. And so the techniques or the tip, the uh, process that I go about doing the surgery is going to be different every time. So with that being said, that also means that certain risks may or may not apply to you, uh, but we're going to go over all the general risks of this surgery. Um, so with any surgery, we also have to talk about the alternatives to, the, to doing surgery, because surgery is not your only option. What other options do you have besides surgery? So for cosmetic purposes, we can use fillers to fill in where there's a bump, to hide the bump. If your tip is derotated or small, we can extend the tip out. If you do have a big nose, then there really is not a lot of options for you because our goal is to make the nose smaller and fillers provide volume to hide any areas of deficiency, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it can make your nose smaller or appear smaller. Uh, in some cases, it can give you the illusion that it does that, but for most larger noses, we can't do that with fillers. The other thing that's a problem with fillers is that we if we add to the tip, it can make your nose appear wider, the tip of the nose, because it's not as good at getting definition as surgery is. So those are the some of the reasons uh, for fillers being an alternative or not an alternative in your case. Um, the other alternative treatments would be, uh, some people will use for your breathing, is to use Breathe Right strips to open up the nasal passages. So if we're doing this for breathing purposes, we might suggest that as an alternative. Other uh, breathing issues, we could use um, uh, stents in the nose, or another option for your breathing issue would be using nasal sprays or medications to help you breathe. So those are alternatives to having nose surgery. If we're doing this for cosmetic purposes, there's usually minimal uh, other options other than surgery, uh, except for fillers for the nasal bump or a tip that's not as extend it out if we need some projection of the tip. All right, so we'll, we'll go on now that to the risks of surgery. So at this point, you've decided to have surgery. And so what do you need to know going into surgery? Because every surgery has its own risks and this is not to be taken lightly. I, I um, would like to tell you that uh, surgery has, most of the risks with surgery are manageable and so there are things that we can kind of tell you ahead of time to minimize those risks but there are also complications that can occur that's unrelated necessarily to how the surgery was performed it can be related to how you heal so I'll go ahead and emphasize which ones and we'll go about uh, talking about each one so the first one the specific to rhinoplasty surgery is the damage to donor sites so Every case, as I said earlier, is different for each patient. Sometimes I need to get um, cartilage from another source. So if you've had previous rhinoplasty surgery, and this is your revision, this is a revision rhinoplasty, know that I may be taking cartilage from the ear or from the ribs. Also, if you're a primary rhinoplasty patient, and we're doing this for Asian rhinoplasty, where we're building up the bridge, I occasionally will also need to get extra cartilage from the ear or from the rib and that will be determined prior to surgery but I still do want to discuss that with you because every uh, area that we've done surgery will have potential for injury to the site, scarring at the site, 
change in shape, a little deformity from harvesting the graft. And that, uh, for instance, for the ear, if we do take cartilage from the ear, you could have increased pain right after surgery. Usually there's more pain from the ear than from the nose from that standpoint. Second process of that is that the shape of your ear may change. Typically, I do not see a change in the shape of the ear, but occasionally, uh, as you're healing, you could get keloid formation or scarring that could cause a change in the shape of the ear. If we do get rib cartilage, there is some there are some risks with rib cartilage, and that would be pneumothorax. Uh, that is where there's air that gets trapped around the lungs and deflates the lungs and causes you to have some um, life-threatening breathing issues. If that were the case, you would need to go to the emergency room right away. How often can that happen? Very rarely. So typically we figure out that right after your surgery, if you've had your rib cartilage harvested for this procedure, we typically get a chest x-ray in the recovery area or the holding, uh, holding area to make sure that you do not have a pneumothorax. Um, the other thing that can happen is chest pain. You're going to have some pain from the rib cartilage harvest and that's going to minimize your ability to breathe because it will hurt every time you breathe in and you're going to, uh, I'm going to tell you after surgery, make sure you're taking deep breaths. If you don't take deep breaths, it can lead to pneumonia. So you want to make sure that you are doing what you need to be doing after surgery. The other thing that can happen is your incision may be more visible or could keloid or could be or could open up. Again, these are all uncommon, but they're possibilities that can happen after surgery. And then the last thing that can happen is that you could have a depression from the area where the rib cartilage was taken from. So if you observed from how it looks, it might be one size a little more depressed, just looking at the shape or concavity of the area. So that is the damage to the donor sites. The second um, risk that I wanna talk about is implants. Uh, we, you'll see this on the consent. I will tell you, I do not use implants for the nose. I don't believe in using implants only because there's a lot of risk with implants for the risk of infection and the, for, for the risk of extrusion. That means the implant showing through the cartil, uh, showing through the, the nose. So it goes through the skin or it gets infected and then comes out. So those are the reasons why I don't use implants, so I don't want you to even worry about this potential risk for rhinoplasty surgery. Now I may use implants, that being said, I may use implants with that being that being uh, cartilage grafts. So typically I use rib cartilage grafts or ear cartilage grafts, but they are your own material, so they should not be foreign to you. So the risk is different when we're using your own material. Occasionally, I may use uh, cadaver rib cartilage, and in that case, there is a slight risk of infection, so I do want to point that out. This is very rare, so if you were getting uh, cadaver rib cartilage, I would tell you beforehand. Uh, next one on that list, when you look at your consent form, will be delayed healing. If the uh, surgery involves me making some fractures in the bone, or shaving bone, or doing anything in that respect, that could lead to delayed healing because the bones have to fuse now in this new position. And when there's space between the bones that you've cracked, they have to create a little bit of this uh, callus. It's called a bone callus. And then from that callus, new bone is formed and then the bone fuses. Typically that takes about six weeks, but for some people it can take longer. And that can uh, be what we call malunion or nonunion that can form. If that were to be the case, you would have persistent infection or swelling in the area. That is uncommon. I do want to point that out. That is uncommon, but more likely to happen is that you just have prolonged swelling in the areas where the bones were fractured. So when a bone is fractured in this area, this part normally is very full and swollen after surgery. Just know that we'll feel firm and that is normal. Okay. That typically goes away after a couple months. So that's delayed healing. The other thing that can happen is if you had an infection after surgery, you could also have delayed healing. That is not happened very frequently, but I've had cases where patients get infection after surgery. When we catch it, we put them on an antibiotic and that typically goes away with the infection, but then it takes your time clock 
back a little bit. So that means that your healing will now be prolonged by maybe a week or a couple weeks. So know that that could happen to you. Uh, next one on that list is nasal septal perforation. If I have made, uh, the, the plan is to uh, work on the septum if it's deviated, or if your septum, we're going to the septum to get a cartilage graft for the surgery, then there's a risk for perforation, which means there's a hole through and through the septum. The septum is right in the middle of your nose and it separates the left side from the right side of your nose. When we lift this, it's like creating, we're pulling wallpaper away from the drywall. That's what I'm gonna explain this as, this is the analogy. And here's your drywall and that's the cartilage. And then the uh, wallpaper is the septal mucosa lining this. And when we pull it away, we take the cartilage and then we put it back. If you do have a cut now on either side of the, the, um, the wallpaper, then you have a hole through and through. And that has to be repaired at the time of surgery to minimize your chance of getting a perforation. Um, my risk with septal perforation is very low with a primary case. I've never had one on a primary rhinoplasty, but the risk with a secondary rhinoplasty, which means a revision case, is that somebody has been in there before, and so there's scarring, and that means it's harder to delineate what's scar and what's cartilage. So if, if in that case, if I feel like there's gonna be a risk, then I will go to the ear or I'll go to the rib for extra cartilage. If I'm going through and I do create a hole, then I'll try to repair at that time. But at that time, I just want to still emphasize for a revision case, there is a higher risk of developing a septal perforation after surgery. Uh, next one on that sheet of paper is nasal airway alterations. That means that you could be more congested. We are doing some work on the inside of the nose. Even for cosmetic purposes, we're narrowing the nose most of the times. And when we narrow the nose, that means you could be more congested after surgery until everything heals. Even after everything heals, if we have done things to narrow your nose, you could potentially develop more trouble breathing that you might not have had before surgery. So I wanna emphasize that to you that I will make uh, changes to your nose that limits the chance of you having some congestion after surgery. So typically, if I do something cosmetic, I will do something functional as well if I feel that the airway will be too small to uh, take on any narrowing. But sometimes that uh, indication, even I've made my best guess, you could still have some trouble breathing after surgery if we've narrowed the size of your nose that being said, okay? Uh, next on the list is substance abuse disorders. This doesn't mean necessarily like alcohol use. This means cocaine use. This means any nasal sprays like Afrin. So we talked about in the post-operative instructions not to continue Afrin after the first four days. It's because of this reason, because if you use it consistently, your nose is gonna get addicted to that medication. It's very similar to cocaine. So what it's gonna do is you're gonna get congested and you're gonna to wanna to use it and keep that cycle of wanting to use it over and over again. So that will not help with the healing process. And so that is something that you need to know going into the surgery that if you use any of those medications, if you use Afrin or norepinephrine, those sprays, or if you're using cocaine, that's a no-no of course. Those are medications you wanna come off of before the procedure. Now. In terms of uh, rhinoplasty surgery, there's, and, and this is true for all types of surgery, there are some general risks for all types of surgery. And that includes, number one, that includes healing. We talked about delayed healing with the bones, but you could be also a slow healer just in the general sense of that. Maybe you have a family history, or you have, you're on multiple medications, or it could be your age or it could be that you are on um, autoimmune medications that makes your immune system lower. So those are all particular reasons that can make you be a slower healer after surgery. Now the second one on that sheet of paper for the consent is bleeding. Bleeding is true for any type of surgery, but in particular with rhinoplasty surgery, the bleeding is gonna come through your nose, right? Through the nostrils. So we uh, have given you post-operative instructions, which says 
you know, you're gonna be using this mustache dressing after surgery. That bleeding is most common in the first 24 hours. Okay, this is true for all of my rhinoplasty cases. So if it's less than that, that's great. If it extends beyond the 24 hours, that can happen. So I don't want you to get worried if after the 20, first 24 hours you're still bleeding. It can still be pinpoint bleeding that kind of happens off and on for the next few days and that's okay. If it's gushing, that is something that you want to call us about. That is not common, that's not normal. And I've occasionally had to take patients into the office and do something to stop the bleeding or we go to the emergency room or in urgent care to take care of that. But then again, I do not want you to worry about this because those are just a handful of cases in my career that I've had to do that. So this is not common, but if you do have bleeding and it's excessive, that's when you want to call us. And you can contact me through the app too because I know that's an urgent issue. So please contact me through the app. Next one on that list is infection. Infection's uncommon with rhinoplasty surgery, but occasionally I do have patients who after surgery feel that their nose is just not feeling right. And that might be you. What you wanna uh, know is that if it's an infection, one, you're gonna have high fevers, you're gonna feel chills, your nose is gonna be really swollen. It's not just the typical swelling, your nose is gonna look distorted. That's atypical and then redness if you have a lot of redness that extends beyond the nose and extends out to the skin around the outside that is not normal so those are all signs of a true infection that you want to call us about if it, there's just pain that that's typical for after a rhinoplasty surgery pain by itself is not an indication of an infection but pain with fevers and with discomfort and with swelling and with redness those are all signs of an infection Ileus, on the consent, what ileus means is that you're constipated. That's because of medications you might have taken. The narcotics will make you constipated and you want to be moving and up around and, and moving around your house as much as possible. The more you walk, the more you're up and moving, the more your bowels will move and you won't get constipated. If you do have a tendency to get constipated, please let me know. I might need to prescribe you something uh, before the surgery at your preoperative appointment that will help you to go. Or if not, you can get over-the-counter medications uh, that you can find at your drugstore to find uh, to use to help you with that after surgery. Scarring. Uh, scarring is typical for all cases where we've made a cut on the skin. When we uh, lift the skin flap, if I'm doing rhinoplasty and I lift that, or even if I'm doing it closed, the dissection that I'm doing, I'm creating a little trauma to the tissues. And in that response, you will create some collagen, you will create some scar underneath the skin. And that will lead to what we call firmness. That's the next thing on the list. When you touch your nose, it will feel firm. Typically, this tip of the nose is the area that stays firm for months. So it's normal, and I don't want you to freak out at three months. You're like, it's still stiff. That's normal. I've told you that this is typical for after rhinoplasty surgery, and that stiffness may not go away until at least six months, maybe sometimes nine months. Everybody's different on how long that stiffness lasts. Typically, if this is your first surgery, if this is a primary rhinoplasty case, it will last you about three to six months. If this is a secondary or revision case, it can last longer. So just be aware of that, that this is normal to have the stiffness and to have the scarring that's underneath the skin. I will make it a point that if it extends beyond a certain time where it's not normal now, I may start doing injections to decrease the amount of scarring that's there or decrease it on a swelling that's there. And that can happen, uh, but typically that's not the case. Uh, next thing on your consent is um, skin sensitivity. As the nerves start waking up, because in the beginning, this whole tip will be numb, the bridge will be numb. Within a few weeks, the bridge, you'll be able to feel that coming back. But the tip will take you almost a year, particularly if this is a secondary or revision rhinoplasty. In those cases, just know as the nerves start waking up, you'll have a jolting, you'll have some like pins and needles, you'll have um, certain temperatures might not feel right, uh, your nose might be more sensitive to cold or to heat. Those are all uh, typical that can happen as the nerves start waking up. Major wound separation, you'll see on that list, that's not normal with rhinoplasty surgery because we're not stretching the skin by a huge amount. 
um, Asian rhinoplasty cases, I am extending the height of the bridge and particularly I might extend the, um, the tip here to rotate it down or extend this columella. In those cases, you can have wound separation where the incision opens up, but those are a few of my patients. Majority of my patients don't need that much volume added to their nose, so they're not gonna see that stretch, they're not gonna see or have the risk of the major wound separation. Sutures, um, for purposes of rhinoplasty surgery, I use dissolvable sutures in all my cases, except for this tip of uh, the the incision on the outside, I do use sutures that I have to take out at one week. Those um, sutures have to come out one week. The rest of the sutures are dissolvable over months. And can you have an uh, infection or can you have a reaction to the sutures? Yes, that can happen. I've never had that before and it is very rare. I've never had to take sutures out. Typically, if you have a reaction, what happens is you just have a little more swelling and the swelling just needs to go away and that's it. Uh, fat necrosis, that means uh, fat dies in the nose. There's really not a lot of fat in the nose, so this is not, um, this doesn't pertain to rhinoplasty, so I'm gonna skip that. Surgical anesthesia means local anesthetic, so something that we've injected to numb the area, or that might be a general anesthesia that your anesthesiologist might be giving at the time of surgery. Those have all their own risks, and the anesthesiologist will go over that at the time of surgery. If you're having sedation with us, then there are some risks with sedation, and that could be that you have allergic reaction to that, or you slow down your breathing and that your respiratory drive is less. We will uh, constantly be monitoring you during the case, and we will usually wake you up, say, hey, you need to take a deep breath for us. That's very uh, uncommon, but it can happen during the case. You usually are not aware of that if that's the case with the sedation. Um, with general anesthesia, there are those risks where um, they're very rare and um, those risks will be outlined by your anesthesiologist. Next on the list is shock. Shock is very rare. I've not had a patient in my single career, that a uh, single patient in my career that has had shock. That means that your body has had all this trauma and it goes into shock. That means your blood pressure drops, you have um, a bad reaction where your heart rate may drop, and this is an emergency where we take you to the hospital. Again, I don't want you to worry about that. These are things that have to be on a consent because we live in a world where everybody wants to know everything that are possibilities. So that is a very rare possibility that can happen. Pain, you will experience pain after the surgery. Uh, the first 24 hours, you may feel some more of a shooting pain or sharp pain. After the first 24 hours, it's more of a discomfort and not pain that you cannot tolerate. Most of my patients need to use pain medication only for the first 24 hours. After that, they're switching to Tylenol. And you may be that case, or you could be one of the uh, smaller group of patients of mine that do require pain medications through the whole first week. It doesn't mean that you are a baby or that you, uh, you know, you're a pain uh, to us, if you need a refill on the pain medications, please let us know. But we wanna make sure that the pain is within the realm of your post-operative um, course and not something that is worse, like it's leading to an infection per se. Cardiac and pulmonary complications. Again, this has to be on every consent. These are rare, but could you have a heart attack or could you have a clot that then goes to your lungs and creates a pulmonary embolus? Those are possibilities, but very rare. In most cases, um, you know, you don't hear this in the news. If it were more common, you would hear it all the time. So, uh, venous thrombosis and clot. That's again with the clot in your legs that can then travel to another area. Allergic reactions. Um, Allergic reactions means uh, medication that we give you or suture material, tapes, glues that we apply. I do apply a glue to keep the tape on top of your nose and to keep the cast on top. That all comes off at one week, but the glue you could have an allergic reaction to. And what would you need to notice is that if you get redness, if you get itchy, and if you get weeping, those are signs of an allergic reaction that you wanna let us know about. A drug reaction would be an allergic uh, reaction to medication we give you. And again, that would be either a rash, uh, hives where you've got some itchy rash, or you've got swelling and a throat closing up. That could be a, a um, airway issue and that you would need to go right to your emergency room and let us know about it too afterwards. 
Um, next on that list is surgical wedding solutions. This does not apply to rhinoplasty, so I want you to skip that, but surgical wedding solutions are dilute anesthetic. We do not do that for the nose. Fat air embolism, that means an embolism from fat uh, that has dislodged, that doesn't occur with rhinoplasty surgery. Air embolism would be air that's in your IV that could potentially embolize and go to your brain or some other spot. That also is very rare to happen. We usually check the IV line to make sure that there's not that present. Persistent swelling is something that can happen with rhinoplasty surgery. Of all the surgeries I do, swelling tends to last the longest in the nose. So that means you're gonna be seeing me for one year or maybe longer. So just know that that is typical and the swelling can take a full year to go out of the nose. So be, um, be aware of that and be patient with the outcome. Unsatisfactory result. Although good results are expected for your case and I take every precaution and I do my absolute best with every case that I do, um, I want you to know that I am not perfect and you may not be happy with the outcome. That can happen, particularly with revision cases that are very difficult to get exactly right. So I want you to be aware of this and know that I am here and I am human and I do want to hear if you are unhappy about something. I don't want you to you know, feel that you can't tell me because if you don't tell me, then I'll never know and we can't try to come to a solution to fix the problem. If it is something minor, we may discuss whether we can fix this with fillers or something else and not try to do surgery. Anytime we do surgery, we open up a new can of worms and we can make things worse. So of course we want you to be happy, but also it is my job to make sure that we do it in the way that is most, uh, that's least risk and the most likely for success where you will be happy and I will be happy as well, okay? So that's unsatisfactory result. Additional advisories, medications and herbs. We will have already gone over this at your preoperative appointment, but there are certain medications that we don't want you to take and some herbs that we want you to stop before surgery. And that's important so that you heal faster and you don't have complications. Sun exposure, direct or tanning salon. You cannot be in the sun one week before surgery. You should have um, seen that in the preoperative instructions, but also post-operative, you don't want to be back in the sun again for a few weeks to maybe a, a month. Uh, sometimes these incisions are not well healed for at least a year. So the incision right down here, if you're exposed to the sun, extending your neck, you're out tanning all the time, that could make your incision not heal properly and you can get either darkening of the incision or a keloid or some other problem to occur. So those are important. Travel plans, uh, we don't want you traveling very far for the first two weeks after surgery. And this is because you can get a clot in your legs. If you're not moving around, you're on a plane for 12 hours and you're sitting in the seat for that length of time and you're not moving around, you could develop a clot in your legs and that could travel to your lungs and cause a pulmonary embolus. This is more true after surgery because your body is healing and it's more likely to be able to develop a clot right after surgery. So you just want to know that. Long-term results. The re results from surgery for rhinoplasty should last you your lifetime. However, there are some things that can affect your long-term result. One being pregnancy. If you get pregnant, the hormones can change the shape of your nose. That sounds weird, but it does happen. I've seen it so many times. So just know that if you do get pregnant uh, and your nose changes shape, it's not a result from the surgery, but actually from results of your hormones that could have changed the shape. Two, aging. Aging can change the cartilage structure where it becomes weaker with time. The um, soft tissue of the nose also can get thicker with time. Have you heard of the, the, um, the quote that people say that your nose can get longer or grow as you age? That can happen. It's not that it grows, it's more that your skin can get thicker and more sebaceous your tip cartilages or cartilage itself can start to hook and that's because the cartilage gets weaker. So those are all typical things that can happen and that's not as a result of the surgery. Weight loss and weight gain can also change your shape of your nose. If you gain a lot of weight really quickly and then lose it very quickly, that could change the shape of your nose. So those are all things to be aware of. Interference with sentinel lymph node mapping. I don't want you to even worry about this. This is more with breast surgery, so skip that. Body piercing. 
Um, if you do have any uh, piercings on your body with jewelry, you want to take the jewelry off before you come in for surgery because that can affect um, we use cautery during the time of surgery to control any bleeding and that cautery can migrate to any jewelry that's on your body and create heat at that site creating a burn so you want to take off jewelry. Nails during the surgery we monitor your um, oxygen status through your nail bed here so that pulse ox needs to pick up your um, uh, the blood flow and if you have any um, nail polish on that's really dark it will not be able to pick that up Future pregnancy and breastfeeding. If you uh, do get pregnant in the future, know that that can have an interference with your results from surgery. Um, it can also stretch the results from surgery as we discussed earlier, and um, you don't wanna be breastfeeding uh, right after the procedure. Female patient information, if you do take a uh, if you do take any estrogen replacement or if you do take birth control pills, that will increase your risk of developing a clot after surgery. So please talk to me about that if you are using that. And we may ask that you just discontinue it for a few weeks leading up to the surgery and after the surgery. And then we'll let you know when you, we want you to be able to resume that again. Intimate relations after surgery. Having sex is an activity and it is um, physical activity that can increase your blood pressure, increase your heart rate, and increase the chance of bleeding and um, having any uh, risks or complications after surgery. The other thing that it can do is, well, you don't want to bump your nose after surgery. That's what we talked about earlier, and that's in the post-operative instructions. You don't want to bump your nose because then we'll ruin the result that we've already achieved and we have to go back to surgery. So try to avoid anything that could bump your nose. Mental health disorders and elective surgery. Know that surgery, having a realistic expectation is important for this surgery. Rhinoplasty surgery is the hardest surgery of all the surgeries that I do to get exactly right because it's a, uh, it's a surgery of millimeters. And so it's important that you know that could your nose, if it's already asymmetric, still be asymmetric after surgery? Yes, indeed particularly the tip of the nose and the nostrils. If there's some asymmetry, getting it exactly right is very hard to do. I will try to achieve it, but I want you to know that I am human and I cannot get perfection 100% of the time. So letting you know that, that um, it's important that you have realistic expectations. We're making your nose look better, but we're not making your nose look like it's drawn from a perfect computer animated um, section, you know, so that that's important that for you to know that. And then additional surgery may be necessary. The risk of having to go back to surgery is about five to six percent of my patients will have to go back and do some minor tweaks. That may be most commonly the bridge of your nose. So whenever we've done a shave, um, the bone itself can create what's called a callus and that callus can then create new bone. And when that creates new bone, then that creates a new bump. If we've taken and shaved off a bump, I am very conservative. I do not like to over shave the bump because it can leave you with a very big swoop and that is an operated look. The second thing that can do is if you've overtaken the bridge, it can affect your breathing after surgery. So I like to be conservative, but that also means when I've shaved the bone and it looks great at the time of surgery, if you do have a callus that forms, it can create new bone and that's a new bump for you. And that's most common reason why I have to go back uh, after surgery and we elect to do that usually at one year we'll go back and decide to do a little shave if we need to and then last parts of this uh, consent is going to be talking about your patient compliance uh, it's important that you follow all the instructions that we've given you uh, including any new instructions that I give you after surgery that haven't been outlined in the post-operative instructions because I might have you start massaging the nose particularly if it was crooked before and we want to maintain it looking straight I may have you doing some exercises after surgery. Attestations, um, smoking, uh, if you are a smoker, know that there are some risks with smoking after surgery. You could have, you could be a slower healer. It could affect your skin that we've raised and cause the skin flap to die. That sounds horrible, but it is something that has happened uh, in my patients, and that means that you've got necrosis. You've got a dark spot that dies off, and that leads to scarring. And that is not something that I want for you, nor do I want it after surgery because we're gonna, we would have to fix that. Okay, 
So if you are a smoker, know that those, those are risks. And if you're not gonna stop smoking after surgery and before surgery, that those are potential things that can happen. Before surgery, you wanna stop smoking for at least three weeks before surgery. In the instructions, you'll see that it says four weeks. Cr very crucial that, that you do stop it as much as you can for one month before the surgery, but I will say up to three weeks. And then after that, really minimizing the smoking as much as possible. Okay. Sleep apnea or CPAP. If you use a CPAP machine, you're going to have to tell me before surgery because it's it usually is sitting right over your nose and we don't want it to affect what we've done with your nose. Some people will use the prongs for the CPAP machine or you might be able to just use a mask with a with the seal not right on your nose. Those are things that I'll, I will discuss with you before surgery and it's important to know if you do uh, wear a CPAP mask. Okay. DVT PE risk. The risk of DVT is very low, but there are some things in that checklist that you'll want to review before your visit with us. And that would be the past, uh, if you have a past history of blood clots, if you have a family history of blood clots, if you, have, uh, you use birth control pills, if you use hormone stimulating drugs, if you get recurrent swollen legs, if you have a history of cancer, if you use large dose vitamins, if you have some other uh, medical history such as varicose veins, you have past history of illness of the heart, lungs, um, GI tract, um, or if you have multiple spontaneous a history of multiple spontaneous abortions or miscarriages those are all potential risks that increase your risk of get, developing a clot after surgery so we want to know that beforehand and we'll assess that at your preoperative visit understand that most of the time the risk is low and so we always grade that and if after surgery um, if your risk is low what we typically have you do is walk as soon as you can to minimize the risk of developing a clot and two, using compression devices during the time of surgery, which these devices squeeze the legs to so squeeze the blood from your veins back up to your heart. Um, we're getting towards the end of this consent. So it will have a, a portion that says com communication acknowledgement. The best way to reach you, um, I do need to know that before surgery. So after surgery, I have a way of contacting you if I need to have you come in or if I'm following up with you. I typically follow up with all my patients the first night after surgery. Um, that night, I will call you or call whoever has been your driver or who is gonna be with you. So just know that please give us the most up-to-date information. And then there's a disclaimer at the end of the consent, which means that this is meant to give you as much information as possible before your surgery. It may not contain everything that is out there, but it is containing the most common that are out there. It is not a cover all for everything. Um, and then the, the last page will say, this, you're authorizing myself to perform the rhinoplasty surgery. There are some things that during the procedure I may change what I do, which is uncommon. I usually have a plan going in before surgery that we've discussed together, and we usually stick to that, that plan. You consent to the administration of anesthetics, uh, you understand what I can or cannot do, that I'm not a perfection, um, that I cannot provide perfection every single time. So we're, we're um, aiming for good and great, but not completely perfect, okay? You understand that there may be photographs that are taken during your surgery. Sometimes I like to take videos or a picture so that you can see right before I start and right after I uh, end before your, uh, we put the cast on so you have an idea of what your nose is going to look like after surgery and some people really like that so I will do that in some cases and um, but this is only going to your chart it's not going to be shared with anybody else. For purpose of advancing medical education I sometimes have observers that might be medical students or that might be um, staff or that could be um, uh, students that are interested in going into to medicine. Um, you consent to disposal of any tissue. So if I take out more than I want and there's some cartilage remaining, I usually put it back. So I don't, I don't typically take out all the cartilage and then toss it. But if there's something else that I might take out, that could be like soft tissue, could be um, when I'm thinning the skin that we're taking some fat on the undersurface, that will get disposed unless you tell me that you want to keep it. You authorize the release of your social security number for using any medical devices, which I typically don't do any medical devices. 
uh, utilize, you're aware that there's potential risk with blood products. I don't use blood products. Um, and you understand what my fees are. Uh, those are separate from the um, facility fees and the anesthesiologist fees. And then you realize that having the surgery is an option. You can opt out. There's gonna be an area where you can opt out, but I think you wanna proceed with surgery. So the last portion, it says that you understand what the risks of the procedure are, you understand what the alternatives would be for the surgery, and you understand that um, there are um, uh, what, what I'm planning on doing for the surgery. So the details of what I'm doing have been described to you, uh, and I will go over that again at your preoperative visit. So that concludes this consent. I know it's been long, but hopefully this has given you more information than what's on the sheet. If you read what, what's on the sheet as well, you'll find that what I'm providing for you through this video should be even more uh, involving of everything that could potentially happen. So thank you for tuning in. If you do have questions, if you do have concerns after surgery or before surgery, please give our office a call, 805-715-4996 or email us at info at facesbydrt.com. And if you have downloaded our Simplast app by this time, you should be able to reach out to me uh, at Dr. Christina Tanzavati through the app or with our medical assistants, Yvonne Cheng and Sarah Landers. Thank you.